Now for this video lecture series, students are going to be able to differentiate between intra and intermolecular forces, rank relative strengths of intermolecular forces, um, discuss the effect that dipole moment, the polarizability of the electron cloud on atoms and molecules, and how shape all have impact on various intermolecular forces. And lastly, uh, students will be able to relate intermolecular forces um, impact on things such as boiling points and melting points. We're all familiar with the main phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Um, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be discussing what holds uh, the molecules together in these various phases of matter. Now, of course, before we do that, let's go ahead and let's talk really quickly about um, those interactions in a generic sense. Um, the interactions in solids uh, are going to be relatively strong relative to um, the liquid and the gas phases. And we're going to talk about what uh, facilitates um, the stronger interactions on the solid side versus much weaker interactions seen in the gases. So let's go ahead and let's look at intra versus intermolecular forces and differentiate there. Intramolecular forces are the forces of attractions that are between atoms within a molecule. Okay, so basically what you can see here is our HCl molecule. Um, this covalent bond here is an example of an intramolecular force. Okay, and this is a covalent bond. Another example of an intramolecular force would be an ionic bond, and we've discussed both of those um, in detail. So basically, guys, the intramolecular forces are the ones that hold atoms together um, within a molecule. So intermolecular forces um, are going to be those that are found um, between molecules. And these are the attractive forces um, that are going to basically allow molecules to be held together in condensed states, such as a solid or a liquid. Okay, um, so the um, types of intermolecular forces that we're going to be looking at are ion dipole, hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole, and London dispersion, and we'll discuss those um, in detail. Now, what I want you guys to also uh, take away from this is that the intramolecular forces that we've discussed um, earlier are going to be considered a strong interaction, um, while the intermolecular are going to be considered a weaker um, attractive situation. So just quickly to simplify that, um, intra is going to be greater um, than your inter. So earlier we talked uh, very briefly about how um, solids have uh, larger uh, attractive forces than say liquids or gases. Um, and what we need to understand is that uh, these stronger interactions or these stronger um, intermolecular forces are what are going to lead to um, our different phases of matters and different properties associated with specific types of uh, matter. So uh, what we need to understand is that the stronger the interactions are, um, basically the more difficult uh, the molecules will be to separate. Um, so basically we'll need to put more energy in in order to separate things out. Um, we also need to understand that the forces are additive and that the relative ranking of our intermolecular forces is as follows. And we're going to discuss why, why each of them um, fall into the ranking that they do. Now, as we go on to discuss intermolecular forces, things I want you to keep in mind. Um, the stronger the interactions that you have um, are going to lead to more difficult to separate molecules. Okay, so basically, the stronger the attractive forces, um, the more energy you have to put in to separate them out. Um, I want you guys to keep in mind that forces are going to be additive. Um, and I want you to keep in mind this ranking system um, as we discuss um, these concepts. So dipole-dipole forces are what we're going to start with. Um, basically, um, as a quick review, remember that molecules that consist of atoms with um, different uh, electronegativity values are going to have a uneven distribution of the electron density, which is represented by the cloud here. And we know that the uh, uneven distribution of that electron cloud um, is going to lead what it, to what is called a dipole moment. Okay, so this dipole moment in the case of dipole-dipole intermolecular forces um, is going to be a permanent dipole. So basically, this, this HCl molecule has a permanent um, di unequal distribution of the electron density across its surface. Now, what ends up happening is that opposite ends of one molecule with a specific dipole um, is going to interact with another molecule um, that has a similar dipole um, situation. 
So we see this here in the diagram between this HCl and this HCl molecule. Notice the partial negative um, portion of this HCl molecule is interacting with the partial positive portion of this um, HCl molecule. So this is a dipole-dipole interaction. So two main things are going to dictate how strong the dipole-dipole intermolecular forces are between two specific um, molecules. Um, so the first is going to be um, the size of the dipole moment. Okay, so that's going to be number one, and number two is going to be the distance between the molecules themselves. Okay, and basically, guys, this is just applying Coulomb's law um, in a slightly different way. Okay, so remember the dipole moments are permanent within the molecules um, in these examples. So the larger that dipole moment, you can think of it as having a larger charge. The larger your charges, we know that those charges are going to be directly proportional um, to the attractive forces between those two molecules. Um, in that same vein, um, the larger the distance between uh, molecules, um, the weaker your attractive forces are going to be. Why? Because that um, attractive force is inversely proportional to the distance between those molecules. Okay, so basically, guys, um, you're going to follow Coulomb's law to help you explain why you might have dipole-dipole uh, -dipole forces that are stronger um, than others. Um, a quick thing I want to point out, uh, dipole moments can be represented by Debye's. Um, as you see here, okay, and what I want you guys to notice is that the relative dipole moments of, of these molecules are increasing from left to right, okay? So we would expect, you know, the dipole-dipole uh, intermolecular forces um, to be stronger in a molecule with a larger dipole versus one with a smaller one. So hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole-dipole intermolecular force. Um, it occurs basically when you have hydrogen attached to um, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Okay. And we can see how um, nitrogen and hydrogen um, are attached here within a molecule, and then that is what facilitates the formation of a hydrogen bond. Okay, so please understand, guys, the nitrogen and hydrogen bond here is not what creates the hydrogen bond. Remember, the hydrogen bond is still an intermolecular force that's occurring between the molecule that contains the nitrogen-hydrogen bond um, and another molecule that's willing to bond with it. Okay, so um, the reason why uh, F, O, or N um, with hydrogen attached um, are going to basically form these special types of bonds um, is that, first of all, um, they have relatively high electronegativities um, and um, they have a small size. Okay, so basically high electronegativities are going to lead to a um, relatively large dipole moment. Um, so your hydrogen is going to have that partial positive, okay, and your partial negatives are going to show up on the FO and, and N atoms. Okay, um, and because hydrogen is such a small atom, what ends up happening is um, the uh, molecules are able to get into close proximity with one another, and you subsequently end up having um, very close interactions between uh, the charges. So, um, based on Coulomb's law, large charges um, because of you know strong dipole moments um, and uh, very very uh, small distances are going to lead to strong intermolecular forces. So let's quickly talk about uh, how intermolecular forces affect boiling point. So basically, um, the stronger your intermolecular forces, um, the higher your boiling point. Okay, why? Because in order to get things to go from the liquid phase into the gaseous phase, we must overcome those intermolecular forces. Okay, so we would expect um, that stronger intermolecular forces are going to um, cause higher boiling points in specific compounds. And this is actually what we end up seeing um, when we look at tabulated data. Okay, so um, in this uh, chart, we have boiling point here along the y-axis. Um, and of course, we have um, various groups that are all containing um, bonding to hydrogen atoms. Now, there are only some of them here, as you see in this group right here, that actually contain hydrogen bonding, okay, which obviously requires hydrogen to be attached to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Um, and what you notice here is that those that have hydrogen bonding end up having um, larger boiling points than, say, something that lacks it completely, as we see down here with this nonpolar molecule. Okay, and we'll talk about nonpolar molecules here in a little bit, but what you need to understand is that as the intermolecular forces, um, energy, and overall strength increase, um, the boiling points and features such as that are going to follow suit. 
As you saw on the other slide, uh, water is going to have a higher boiling point than hydrofluoric acid. And some of you may have been a little bit um, confused by why that might be the case, given that fluorine is the most electronegative, um, it's relatively small, so, so that dipole moment should be big, and the um, atom size should basically allow for uh, close proximity. Um, what you need to understand here is the reason why H2O is going to have a higher boiling point has to do with um, its structure and its bonding capability. Um, because water molecules have those three atoms um, in the structure, what ends up happening is that you have multiple locations where hydrogen bonding can occur in um, the molecule. Okay, And we see that um, throughout this a uh, nice little diagram here. Uh, notice the partial negative oxygens interacting with a hydrogen here, but also one here, okay? And they all kind of interact with each other um, in a more substantial way. Now, remember a few slides back, we said that intermolecular forces are additive. So in this context, uh, more hydrogen bonds are able to be formed between water molecules than HF molecules. And that's what leads to the higher boiling point um, associated with water. We're going to go ahead and talk about ion dipole forces. These are the strongest intermolecular forces of the bunch. Um, and now that we understand dipole, dipole, and H bonding, um, hopefully the ion dipole reasoning will make a lot of sense. Okay, so basically the ion dipole um, occurs when you have an ion, such as something found in an ionic compound um, like sodium chloride. Okay, um, and uh, when those ions end up in interacting with a polar molecule, so something such as H2O, okay? And so what ends up happening here, guys, is that um, the partial positive and partial negative components um, interact with the ions uh, that are present in that salt. Okay, so what ends up happening here, notice uh, right here in this example to the right, we have the sodium ion. Sodium is plus one in charge. Um, and so what ends up happening is notice all of the oxygen atoms are orienting towards that sodium ion. So basically, um, the negative portion of the polar molecule interacts with the positive ion. Okay, in that same sense, um, the chloride ion from that salt is negative. Uh, so the positive, partially positively charged um, hydrogens are what are going to interact with um, that chloride ion. Uh, so basically, some things to think about in this context are um, charges, okay? So remember, charge is going to be directly proportional to those intermolecular forces. So the larger the charges, um, the stronger those intermolecular force, uh, forces that are present uh, in that situation. Okay, so what we see here, guys, is that um, compared to the dipole-dipole interactions or the hydrogen bonding where the interactions are occurring between two molecules that have partial negative and partial positive charge, in this context, one of the components has a full on plus one, plus two, plus three, or minus one, minus two, minus three charge. Okay, so that is a bigger charge. Okay, and we know if we increase the charges, um, that we increase the attractive forces. If we increase the attractive forces, we increase the intermolecular forces. Um, so ion dipoles are going to be um, stronger intermolecular forces than the others because we have an overall uh, larger charge interaction. So now that we understand this concept, let's go ahead and talk about um, our final intermolecular force, the London dispersion force. So we're going to go ahead and look at London dispersion forces as our final intermolecular force. Uh, London dispersion forces are also sometimes called van der Waals interactions, depending on the text or the teacher. Um, so I want you guys to be sure that you're comfortable with both uh, nomenclature. Um, they mean the same thing. Now, London dispersion forces are the weakest intermolecular force. Um, all molecules have London dispersion forces. Um, however, nonpolar molecules only have London dispersion forces as their intermolecular forces. So the reason why we do not pay attention to the London dispersion forces in uh, polar molecules is because they contain uh, intermolecular forces that are in, going to end up being stronger, such as dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding. Um, and so those are going to contribute more heavily to the features such as boiling point or melting point of those specific substances. Okay, so nonpolar molecules are when London dispersion forces are going to be the focus. Okay, now without London dispersion forces, we wouldn't have solids or liquids. Now, the intermolecular forces that we've talked about um, previously all had examples 
of molecules that had permanent dipole moments. Well, in the case of molecules that do not have a permanent dipole moment, um, what you end up uh, seeing is that the electron density around the atoms um, forms what is known as an instantaneous dipole. So what ends up happening is you have um, a dipole moment that forms, but only lasts for a certain quantity of time. So London dispersion forces happen when randomized um, polar moments happen within the molecules. Um, that then encourages other molecules in close proximity to also form an instantaneous dipole, and then they end up attracting each other. Now, because this dipole can come and go, um, these interactions are not permanent, and that lack of permanency leads to the weakness of the London dispersion forces. Now, London dispersion forces are going to be affected by a few factors. So, two things that are going to affect our London dispersion forces are going to be the polarizability of the electron cloud, which is usually connected to molecular weight, because the larger your molecular weight, usually the more electrons you have, um, and, of course, your shape of your molecules. Now, uh, if we go ahead and we look at that polarizability, the more electrons you have, the more likely you are going to have an instantaneous dipole because the cloud can move around. Um, and so if we go ahead and we look at, say, the boiling points here associated with neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, notice as you increase the size of those atoms, you end up with more polarizability. More polarizability leads to the um, likelihood of forming an instantaneous dipole. Instantaneous dipole is going to lead to the London dispersion forces, and subsequently the more of those you have, the higher your attractive forces. The higher your attractive forces, the higher your boiling point. Okay, And that can be seen um, also with our halogen molecules here um, as well. Okay, So the second thing that's going to be affecting it um, the London dispersion forces is the shape. Okay, so uh, if we go ahead and we look at um, this straight chain fatty acid, um, what you need to understand here is that London dispersion forces are going to occur in this molecule as well as this um, fatty acid that does not have a straight chain. Now the difference is is that in the case of the straight chains, right, they're going to be able to stack nicely um, amongst each other. And basically, by having close proximity and nice stacking, you're more likely to get those London dispersion forces um, to occur and basically show up um, within the molecule. In the case of the um, unsaturated fatty acid, what ends up happening is the, the kinks in the chain make it where the uh, intermolecular forces are going to have a harder time forming because less surface area is um, touching or in close proximity for each of the molecules. Now this directly connects to why uh, we have saturated fats and unsaturated fats um, and their behavior at room temperature. So um, typically saturated fats such as butter or lard, um, they're going to be solids at room temperature while our unsaturated fats um, are going to be liquids. And the reason why is because the unsaturated fats have areas within the molecule that have less hydrogens um, than are possible. Um, because they have double bonds or, or maybe even triple bonds. And what ends up happening is that that causes kinks in the chain, which then decrease those um, molecular overlaps and subsequently decrease your um, intermolecular forces. So remember, polarizability of the electron cloud, um, which is currently connected to molecular weight, and the shape are going to be your determining factors. So let's go ahead and apply a quick practice problem. So we're asked to list the following in order of increasing intermolecular forces. Um, so what we're going to first do is identify the intermolecular forces that are present in each of these examples. Okay, so if we go ahead and we look at NE, okay, we know that NE is going to be a nonpolar atom. All it has is just um, a nucleus and electrons surrounding it, so it's going to be nonpolar. Because it's nonpolar, it's going to have London dispersion forces as its primary intermolecular force. Um, let's go ahead and look at HF. HF is a polar molecule, okay, and it's a polar molecule that contains a hydrogen attached to F, O, or N. So in this case, it's a polar molecule that has um, hydrogen bonding capabilities, okay. Um, CO is going to be a polar molecule that does not have a hydrogen attached to F, O, or N. So the intermolecular force here is going to be dipole, dipole. Okay, and then H2 is going to be a um, nonpolar molecule. 
Okay, and so therefore, London dispersion forces are going to be its strongest um, interaction. Okay, so based on our understanding of uh, intermolecular forces, we know that hydrogen bonding is going to be the strongest um, example of uh, our intermolecular forces. So it's going to be at the top. Okay, we know dipole-dipole is the next uh, strongest in this particular grouping. Okay, and then uh, neon and H2, um, we need to decide between them because London dispersion forces are what's going to be the determining factor. Now, I want you guys to understand that it can be hard to compare, say, a compound um, or, or something that has bonding structure to something that's just an individual atom. Um, so there may be some confusion. In this context, though, um, neon can be looked at with respect to uh, the number of electrons that it has versus the number of electrons that hydrogen has. So neon has way more electrons than the two hydrogen atoms. Um, and because of that, the neon's neon's cloud is going to be more, more polarizable than that seen around hydrogen. Okay, so we're going to say that uh, neon has um, stronger London dispersion forces than um, the hydrogen example.